Performance comes from inside, not outside. Success is not something you pursue. Success is something you develop. You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. Unless you change how you are, you'll always have what you've got. The major key to your better future is you. The key to a great future is within you, and you'll be able to find it and use it with Success Strategies, Seven Keys to Wealth and Happiness. These keys will help you unlock the door to success that faces every one of us. All we have to do is use the right combination of skills and knowledge. In this exciting program, Jim Rohn will help you find the way to achieve your goals in every area of your life. You don't have to sacrifice family and friends to gain wealth and professional prestige. You just have to have the right plan. And Jim will help you map out your personal path to success, just as he's helped companies around the world reach their goals. You'll benefit from his wisdom and knowledge, gathered in a more than 25-year study of behaviors that affect performance. Jim Rohn has first-hand experience of what these behavioral factors can do. His is the story of a small town boy made good, very good. With the help of a wise mentor to whom he'll introduce you, Jim forged his way right to the top. He'll show you how you can do the same by implementing a few key strategies. In this program, you'll hear how to choose a lifetime of achievement instead of settling for one of mediocrity. You'll discover how to develop the critical advantages that lead to major accomplishments, and you'll learn how to get more satisfaction and enjoyment out of every area of your life, whether it's financial, personal, or professional. Jim Rohn's ideas work, as his clients around the world have discovered. He's earned a reputation as a dynamic and effective trainer all over North America, England, Spain, Taiwan, and Australia. In this program, you too will reap the benefits these companies have paid thousands of dollars for, and you'll have a private one-on-one -on -one session with Jim Rohn. And now, the Nightingale Conan Corporation is very pleased to present Mr. Jim Rohn. This is Jim Rohn. You're going to hear a great number of ideas as you go through the sessions on these six cassettes. Ideas that help successful people accomplish more of their goals, achieve certain wealth, and experience greater joy and satisfaction in their lives. My hope is that you'll find a few of these ideas very useful to you right now. Unfortunately, I don't know you personally. I'm not familiar with your dreams or your problems. But fortunately for you, I don't need to be because the ideas we'll be talking about on these cassettes are fundamentals to the art of winning. They will help you achieve your most inspiring dreams, guaranteed. They are, in fact, the seven fundamentals for wealth and happiness. As we go through these cassettes, you'll see very clearly for yourself just how these ideas can start making a major difference in your life right away. Where did these fundamentals come from? I didn't make them up. I first discovered them when I was 25 years old, at a time in my life when I needed some new ideas to help change the direction of my life. I wasn't destitute at the time, but I certainly needed some help. I guess we could all use a little help at age 25. Let me take a minute to tell you how it happened. I had gotten off to a great start in life. I was raised in farm country in Idaho, a small community of about 5,000 people, not far from the Snake River in the southwest corner of the state, a great place to grow up. In fact, my parents still live in this small farm community. My father is 82 years old, my mother 75. And they are still healthy and doing very well, as active now as they have ever been. I'm very proud of them, and they have always been a great example for me. After graduating from high school, I went to one year of college, and then I decided I was smart enough, so I quit which was one of my major mistakes. Among many major mistakes I made in those early days, 
But I was ambitious and willing to work hard and figured I wouldn't have any trouble getting a job, which turned out to be accurate. So with a head full of dreams and ambitions, I started my first job. About three years later, I got married, made lots of promises, worked hard, and a couple of years later started a family. And at age 25, I started taking a new look at my life. My weekly paycheck amounted to the grand total of $57. I was far behind on my promises, behind on my bills, and discouraged. I was far from making the progress I thought I should have made. I was willing to work hard, that was not my problem. But it was clear that it was going to take more than hard work. And I didn't want to wind up at age 60 broke, needing assistance, like so many people I saw around me, not in the richest country in the world. So what do you do to change the direction of your life? I thought, well, I should go back to school. One year of college doesn't look that good on an application. But now with my family starting, going back to school seemed like a tough decision. I didn't have any money to start my own business. Money was one of my problems. I always had far too much month left over at the end of the money if you've ever been in that position. I remember one time losing $10 and I was physically ill for two days over a $10 bill. Some of my friends tried to be cheerful. They said, look, maybe some poor person who needed it found it. But that was not really helpful. I must admit at that time in my life, benevolence had not yet seized me. I was the person who needed to find $10, not lose 10. So that's where I was at that time in my life, behind on my dreams and constantly wondering what I could possibly do to change my life for the better. Well, at age 25, good fortune came my way. And many times it's difficult to explain good fortune. Why do unique things happen to you when they do? I don't know. Part of that is a mystery to me. However, my good fortune was meeting a man, a very unique and successful man. His name was Mr. Earl Shope. When I met him, I said to myself, I would give anything to be like him. I wonder what it would take. Well, to make a long story short, this very special gentleman took a liking to me. And a few months after I met him, he hired me and I went to work for him. I spent the next five years working for him in several of his businesses. And then unfortunately he died. But I did get to spend five years with this remarkable man. And the best thing he gave me during that five years was not a job. The best thing he gave me was the benefit of his philosophy. The fundamentals of living successfully. How to be wealthy. How to be happy. And sure enough, his ideas worked for me. So I will always be grateful for meeting someone who made a difference in how my life worked out. I am sure if Mr. Schof were still alive... I would have called him one more time today and thanked him for sharing the ideas and inspiration that changed my life. For many years, I shared this philosophy for wealth and happiness with my business partners and met with equally exciting results. I am primarily a businessman, not a professional public speaker, but I have been intrigued with the challenge of trying to put into words the ideas that can make a difference in how a person's life works out. And now I have the chance to share these ideas with you. I don't claim to have all the answers on how to do well, but I do have some answers that have worked extremely well for me and thousands of others. Take these ideas and edit them all you wish. You certainly don't have to buy everything any one person says, but give me a chance. If something sounds good, try it. If it doesn't make sense, discard it. Remember, don't be a follower, be a student. All the ideas we'll discuss in these cassette sessions will stem from a group of very important key concepts. I'd like to begin this session by briefly but clearly looking at each of them. These key words are very important for us to understand if we're to get maximum value from this program and add significantly to our wealth and happiness. The first key word is fundamentals. What a most important word, fundamentals. 
This word calls attention to the primary issue in our quest for greater success. It is the key word in making our lives work well. Fundamentals. Those basics that build the foundation for accomplishment, productivity, success, and lifestyle. Fundamentals form the beginning, the basis, the reality from which everything else flows. And remember, there are no new fundamentals. Fundamentals are old, well-established. Beware of someone who claims to have a new fundamental. That's like someone who claims to manufacture antiques. We would have to be suspicious, right? So fundamentals, basics, they are so very important to understand and consider and practice if you wish for the good life. And may I add here, make sure you don't go looking for the exotic answers to success. Success is a very basic process. It doesn't fall out of the sky. It doesn't have any mysteries, nor does it fall into the realm of the miraculous. Success is merely a natural result that comes from the consistent operation of the practical fundamentals. As someone wisely remarked, to be successful, you don't have to do extraordinary things. Just do ordinary things extraordinarily well. Mr. Schoff, my teacher, gave me many great phrases I'll always remember. One of them was, there are always about a half dozen things that make 80% of the difference. What a key thought, a half dozen things. Whether we are working on our health, wealth, personal goals, or professional enterprise, the difference between our ultimate success or inevitable failure lies in the degree to which we are willing to seek out, study, and to go to work on those half dozen things. For a farmer to reap a plentiful harvest in the fall, for example, the major basics are fairly obvious. Soil, seed, water, sunshine, nourishment, and care. Each fundamental being equally in need of study and attention. For together they bring about the best chance for a successful harvest. A good question to ask before undertaking any project or setting any new objective then is what are the most important half dozen things that will make the major difference in how it works out. So whether the enterprise is art or architecture, music or sculpture, mathematics or sports, business or farming, success or lifestyle, it's the fundamentals that count. To understand them and to practice them is to take the first intelligence step toward accomplishing your objectives and living your dreams. The second key word for us to consider is Wealth. Wealth is a word that brings about a wide variety of mental images. And that is part of my purpose in these cassettes, to provoke that wide variety of mental images. For that is where the dreams are. That is where the inspiration comes from. And that is where true incentive is born. The mystery and mixture of mental image, the stuff and the staff of life. Its right use, its constant use is the way to a life unique and a life abundant. Now to one, wealth means having enough financial substance to be able to do whatever you wish to do with your life. To another, it may mean freedom from debt, freedom from the constant claim of obligation. To yet another, it means opportunity. And to many, wealth means a million dollars. That's a unique word, millionaire. It rings of success, freedom, power, Influence, pleasure, possibility, benevolence, and excitement. Not a bad mental image. Now we could talk of the wealth of experience, the wealth of friends, the wealth of love, the wealth of family, the wealth of culture. Wealth of many kinds. However, in this program, we are more specifically going to talk about wealth in the sense of financial freedom. Wealth that comes from the conversion of effort and enterprise into currency and equity. For each of us, the amount of money required to be wealthy will differ. But the dream for all of us, I'm sure, is the same. Freedom from financial pressure. More freedom of choice, freedom to enjoy, and the opportunity to create and to share. Wealth, the possession of great financial resources that improves the quality of your life and gives you added dignity and expanded lifestyle. So decide for yourself what wealth means to you. Latch on to your own mental image of wealth 
and let's see if the ideas I'm about to bring to you will make sense and perhaps provide you with the inspiration to put the plan into high action so that as the days pass, you will discover a growing sense of freedom and dignity, self-worth, substance, and lifestyle. The next key word is happiness, the universal quest. Happiness is a joy that most often comes as a result of positive activity. Like wealth, it too has a wide variety of meanings and interpretations. Happiness is both the joy of discovery and the joy of knowing. It is a result of an awareness of the full range of life, the color, the sound, the harmony. And it is the joy that comes from designing a life and practicing the fine art of living well. Happiness is being able to explore the offerings of life by perception, response, and enjoyment. Happiness is both receiving and sharing, reaping and bestowing. It is being able to feast on harmony as well as food, on ideas as well as bread. Happiness is the deliberate act to create a wider world of experience and awareness. Happiness is having a handle on disappointment. It is being in control of both emotion and circumstance. Happiness is freedom from the negative children of fear, such as worry, low self-esteem, envy, greed, anger, resentment, and so on. Happiness is an awareness and a grasp of the positive power of life and loving values. It is an order of thought, activity, and lifestyle. Happiness is values in balance. It is contact with people of substance. Happiness is contentment with the tasks of your life. It is thought inspired by, organized with, and rooted in your personal philosophy. Happiness is a life well lived in which a wide variety of experiences are deliberately captured to become an invaluable form of currency for you to spend and invest in your own better future. Happiness is activity with purpose. It's love in practice. Happiness is both a grasp of the obvious as well as an awe of the mysterious. But for most people around us, happiness seems to be either something left behind or something yet to be discovered. Like all the good things in life, happiness is elusive by nature, but not impossible to capture. A major key for bringing joy into our lives lies in the next word we shall briefly examine. Discipline. If there is a magic word that stands out above all the rest, this is the one. Discipline. And in this program, you'll discover how positive this word is. Discipline is the bridge between thought and accomplishment the bridge between inspiration and value achievement, the bridge between necessity and productivity. Remember, all good things are upstream. The passing of time takes us adrifting, and drifting only brings us the negative, the disastrous, the disappointment and the failure. Failure is not a cataclysmic event. It is not generally the result of one major incident, but rather a long list of accumulated little failings. Failing in life is failing to think today, failing to act today, failing to care, to strive, to climb, to learn, to keep trying day by day. If your goal requires that you write 10 letters today and you write only three, you are down seven letters. If you want to make five calls and you only make one, you are down four on calls. If your plan calls for saving $10 today and you save none, you're down $10 today. Now the danger is looking at an undisciplined day and concluding that no great harm has been done. It doesn't seem like such a bad day, but add up these days to make a year and then add up those years to make a lifetime. And perhaps you can now see how repeating today's small failures can easily turn your life into a major disaster. Success on the other hand is just the same process in reverse. If you plan to make 10 calls and you end the day making 15, now you're up five calls. If you then get up a few on letters, move up the savings numbers, you can see what a massive difference it could make in a year and what wealth and accomplishment awaits for a lifetime. Discipline is like a set of magic keys that unlocks all the doors of wealth, happiness, sophistication, culture, high self-esteem, pride, joy, accomplishment, satisfaction, 
and success. The first key to discipline is awareness of the need for and the value of discipline, and especially the discipline to make the changes. What will it take? What must I do? And what must I become to get all I want from my life? The second key is the willingness. More than that, the eagerness to maintain your new discipline deliberately, wisely, consistently. And the third key to discipline is the commitment to master the circumstances of your daily life, to see and harness the opportunities to make something of the sun and the rain, the good as well as what comes in the guise of misfortune. Discipline does many things, but most important of all is what it does for you. It makes you feel better about yourself. Even the smallest discipline can have an incredible effect on your attitude. And the good feeling you get, that surging feeling of self-worth that comes from starting a new discipline, is almost as good as the feeling that comes from the accomplishment of the discipline. Second, a new discipline immediately alters your life direction. You don't change destinations immediately. That is yet to come. But you can change direction immediately. And direction is very important. Third, discipline cooperates with nature. Everything strives. It is a common life function. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it can. Everything strives to become all it can possibly be. And that striving to become is what discipline is all about. Disciplining ourselves to fulfill our natural potential to become all that we can be. And finally, discipline attracts opportunity. Opportunity is always looking for ambition and skill in action. Discipline taps the unlimited power of commitment. The human will in action, driven by inspiration, enticed by desire, tempered by reason, guided by intelligence, can bring you to that high and lofty place called the good life. Discipline, those unique steps of intelligent thought and activity that put a lid on temper and a faucet on courtesy, that develop positive and control negative, that encourage success and deter failure, that design lifestyle and control frustration, that enhance health and curb sickness, that promote happiness and manage sadness. Discipline, the start and the continuing process that brings all good things. And remember, anyone can start the process. It's not if I could, I would. It's if I would, I could. If I will, I can. So start the new process. You can begin a new habit no matter how small it is. Small isn't important. Whether or not you start and whether or not you continue are all that is important. And don't be deluded by an affirmation only affirm what you are truly prepared to do. Many of us delude ourselves with our words into believing that we're making changes and making progress when in fact our daily activity is taking us in the exact opposite direction of our affirmations. Why would you walk in the opposite direction of your dreams? The man dreams of wealth and walks daily towards certain financial disaster. The man wishes for happiness and thinks the thoughts and commits the acts that take him to certain despair. So to have a prosperous life, start a prosperity plan. To become wealthy, start a wealth plan. Remember, you don't have to be wealthy to have a wealth plan. A person with no means can have a rich plan. If you are ill, start a health plan. If you don't have energy, start an energy plan. If you don't feel good, start a feel good plan. If you're not smart, start a smart plan. If you can't, start a can plan. If you haven't, start a have plan. Anyone can. Even a bad person can start hearing good messages and reading good books. Recognize that the start of the better life, the happy life, the wealthy life, is today. This is exciting. Both the process and the result can begin today. Start the new journey today. If you think of a new idea, today is the day to begin the discipline of putting that idea into action. Set this day up as a long, busy, exciting start for your new life. Get your first book for your new library today. Begin your new practice of setting goals today. Start clearing out a drawer of your new orderly desk 
today. Start eating an apple a day on your new health plan today. Put some money in your new investment for fortune account today. Start reading with intensity for your new wealth of mind plan today. Write a postponed letter today. Make a delayed telephone call today. Pick up your camera and take a picture of something to start your new treasury of photographs today. Get some momentum going on your new commitment to the better life. See how many activities you can pile on in this first day. Go all out. Break away from the negative downward pull of gravity. Start the thrusters going. Prove to yourself that waiting is over, hoping is past, and that faith and action have now taken charge. It's a new day, a new beginning for your new life. With discipline, you can't believe the list of positive moves you can make in the first day of your new beginning. What have you got to lose? Only the despair and fear and guilt of the past. Only the dissatisfaction and unhappiness and lack of fulfillment of the past. Only the frustration and low self-esteem of the past. Take great pleasure in assisting in your own new birth, no matter how successful you may already be. Now I offer you the next challenge. Make this new first day a part of the week of new beginnings. See how many things you can continue and start in this week of new beginnings. Then make it the first month of the new beginnings. Then the first year of the new beginning. By the time that first year is finished, you will never again be claimed by the past. Past habits, past influences, past regrets, or past failures. You are ready to, as the Bible phrase says, fly with the eagles. And you will have begun your certain journey toward the last key concept we'll discuss on this cassette. Success. Success is both a journey and a destination, isn't it? It is both the steady, measured progress toward a goal and the achievement of a goal. Success is an accomplishment, whether it be great or small. And it's an understanding of the potential and power of an entire human life. Success is an awareness of value, and it's the cultivation of value through discipline. It can be tangible or intangible. Success is a process of turning away from something in order to turn toward something else. From no exercise to exercise, from candy to fruit, from not investing to investing. Success is responding to an invitation. An invitation to change, to grow, to develop, to become, to move up to a better place with a better vantage point. But most of all, success is making your life what you want it to be. Considering all the possibilities, considering all the examples, what do you want for your life? That is the big question. Remember, success is not a set of standards from our culture, but rather a collection of personal values clearly defined and ultimately achieved. Success is your better life for you, the design you give it, the dreams you accomplish. Making your life what you want it to be for you, that is success. All right, with that overview of some of the key concepts we'll explore in this program, let's begin the further development of your success by looking at the art of properly selecting and setting goals. I think you'll hear a couple of thoughts you've never heard before. Of all the things that changed my life for the better most quickly, it was learning how to set goals. And mastering this unique process can have a powerful effect on your life too. One morning at breakfast, shortly after I met Mr. Shelf, he asked me if he could see my current list of goals. He said, let me see your list of goals and let's go over them and talk about them. Maybe that's the best way I can help you right now. And I said, I don't have a list. He said, well, is it out in the car or at home somewhere? I said, no, sir. I don't have a list anywhere. He said, well, young man, that's where we better start. Then he added, if you don't have a list of your goals, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars, which he did. And that got my attention. I said, you mean that if I had a list of goals, that would change my bank balance? 
He said, drastically. That day I became a student of how to set goals. And sure enough, when I learned how, my whole life changed. My income, my bank account, my personality, my lifestyle, my accomplishments. So I'd like to share with you the best I have learned and practiced on goal setting. First of all, I'd like to say that we are all affected by five factors. The first is environment. The second is events. The third is knowledge. The fourth is results. And the fifth and often overlooked factor that affects our lives is our view of the future, our dreams. I won't get into all of these influences here, but let me concentrate on the fifth one, dreams. Of all these five influences, make sure your dreams are the greatest influence on your daily decisions and activities. Put another way, make sure that the greatest pull on you is the pull of the future. For your dreams to greatly influence you, for the future to pull you, your future must be well planned. There are two ways to face the future. One is with apprehension, the other with anticipation. Guess how many people face the future with apprehension? Why? They don't have it well designed. And without really thinking about it, they have probably bought someone else's view of how to live. You will face the future with anticipation when you have planned a future you can get excited about. When you have designed your future results in advance. In this way, the future will capture your imagination. It will exert an enormous influence on you. And to design your future, you must have goals. Well-defined goals are like a magnet. They pull you in their direction. And the better you have defined them, the better you have described them, the harder you work on them, the stronger they pull. And they pull you through all kinds of difficulties too. Without goals, it is easy to let life deteriorate to the point where you're just making a living. It is not difficult to get trapped by economic necessity and settle for existence rather than substance. We all have a choice. We can either make a living or design a life. Mr. Shove said to me, I don't think your current bank balance is a true indicator of your level of intelligence. I was happy to hear that. He said, I think you have plenty of talent and ability and that you're much smarter than your bank balance indicates. And that turned out to be true. I was much smarter. My question to him was, then why isn't my bank balance bigger? And he said, you don't have enough reasons for accomplishing great things. If you had enough reasons, you could do incredible things. You have enough intelligence, but not enough reasons. That's the key, if you had enough reasons. In my years of study, I've also discovered this. Reasons come first, and answers come second. Life has a strange way of hiding all the answers and disclosing them only to people who have been inspired to look for them, who have reasons to look for them. Put another way, when you know what you want, and you want it badly enough, you will find ways to get it. The answers, the methods, the solutions will become evident to you. Hey, what if you had to be rich? Are there any books and tapes on the subject? The answer is yes. There are plenty of good ones. But if you don't have to be rich, you probably won't read the books or listen to the tapes. What drives us to find the answers is necessity. So work on your reasons first, answer second. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? It varies from person to person. I'm sure that if you did a little soul searching, you could come up with a fairly strong list of reasons why you want to accomplish great things. There are personal reasons, sometimes uniquely personal reasons. Some people do well for the recognition. Some do well because of the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. That's one of the best reasons. I have some millionaire friends who keep working 10 to 12 hours a day making more millions. And it's not because they need the money. It's because of the joy, pleasure, and satisfaction 
that come to them from being constant winners. To them, money is not their main drive. It's not the money. It's the journey. Once in a while, someone says to me, if I had a million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. Hey, that's probably why the good Lord sees to it that he doesn't get his million. Because he'd just quit. Family is another reason or motivator for doing well. Some people do extremely well because of other people. And that's a powerful reason. Sometimes we will do things for someone else that we would not do for ourselves. We are made that way. I met a man who once said to me, Mr. Rohn, to do everything I want to do around the world with my family, I need at least a quarter of a million dollars a year. I thought, incredible. Could a man's family affect him that much? And the answer is, of course. How fortunate are the people who find themselves greatly affected by someone else. It's powerful. Benevolence. The desire to share can be a powerful reason for wanting to achieve. Some people do extremely well gathering up resources so they can then be benefactors. When Andrew Carnegie, the great steel magnet, died, his desk was opened and in one of the desk drawers was found a slip of paper. On that slip of paper, Mr. Carnegie had written his goal for his life and he wrote it when he was in his 20s. On that slip of paper, he had written I'm going to spend the first half of my life accumulating money. I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. That's terrific. He was so inspired by that goal that during the first half of his life, he accumulated $450 million. And during the last half of his life, he gave it all away. How powerful. What has you turned on? What has you getting up early, hitting it hard all day and staying up late? What has you inspired? Next question, what's got you turned off? When I found the answers to those two questions, my life exploded into change. I finally found out what negative philosophy of life I had allowed to limit me and had me turned off. And I got that cured. Then I found a long enough list of reasons to turn me on. And once the lights went on for me at age 25, they have never gone out. I've fallen out of the sky a few times, but I've never lost that drive to do something unique with my life. Now there's another list of reasons for doing well called nitty gritty. Those hard little reasons that can really affect your life. Sometimes it doesn't take much of a goal to start you in a brand new life direction. I now carry a few hundred dollars in my money clip. It's only a few hundred dollars, but the story behind why I do it reveals one of those reasons that greatly affected me. Just before I met Mr. Show, I heard a knock at my door one day. When I opened it, there was a little girl selling Girl Scout cookies. And she gave me one of the finest sales presentations I've ever heard. A special deal, several flavors, and only $2. Back when you could get a lot for $2. And with a big smile, she very politely asked me to buy. And I wanted to. Big problem. I didn't have $2. And to this day, I can still clearly remember the pain and the embarrassment. I was a father. I had been to college, I was working, and I didn't have two dollars. Now, since I didn't want to tell her that, I did what I thought was next best. I lied to her. I said, hey, I've already bought lots of Girl Scout cookies. I've still got plenty stacked in the house. Now, that wasn't true, but it seemed to get me off the hook for the moment. She said, that's wonderful, sir. Thank you very much. And she went away. After she had left, I closed the door and that was the day I said, I don't want to live like this anymore. I've had it with being broke and I've had it with lying. I've had it with being embarrassed over not having any money in my pocket. 
I promised myself that day that this would never happen again. I picked a day and an amount, and I said, I'll never carry less. It was one of those reasons that still affects my life after all these years. So I now carry a few hundred dollars in my money clip. I do that for two reasons, I guess. One reason is the way it makes me feel, that special feeling of having plenty. Mr. Shove said to me, the first $500 you earn, put into your pocket, not in the bank. It feels much better in your pocket than it does in the bank. I've found that's true. But I also carry plenty in case I bump into another Girl Scout who's selling cookies. I'm ready. I remember walking out of the bank one day in Northern California where I lived at the time, and there were two little girls selling candy right outside the bank for some girls' organization. The first little girl walked up to me and said, Mister, would you like to buy some candy? I said, I probably would. What kind is it? She said, it's Almond Roca. I said, that's my favorite. She said, wonderful. I asked, how much is it? She said, it's only $2. I thought, it couldn't be. Still $2 after all these years? I couldn't help remembering the Girl Scout and the cookies. I said, how many boxes of that candy have you got? She said, I've got five. And the other little girl standing there, she was selling candy too. I asked, how many boxes do you have? She said, I've got four. I said, that's nine. I'll take them all. They said, really? I said, yes, I've got some friends, so I'll pass them around. They got so excited, put all this candy together. I reached into my pocket and gave them $18. Now, when I've got the candy and they've got the money, that first little girl looks up and says, Mister, you are really something. How about that? Can you imagine only spending $18 and having someone look at you in the face and say, you are really something? Now you know why I carry heavy. I'm not going to miss those chances anymore. It was a small goal, just a few hundred dollars, but it had a big effect on my life. I have a dear friend, Robert DePew. Bobby used to be a school teacher in Lindsay, California, the olive capital. After he taught school for several years, he became a little weary of teaching and decided to get into sales. One day, without telling anyone, he quit his teaching job and jumped into sales. When he did, his brother poked fun at him. His brother said, you're going to go right down the drain. You had a good teaching job. Now you're going to lose everything you have. You must be out of your mind. He put him down something fierce. Bobby said, the way my brother acted made me so angry, I decided to get rich. Today, Robert happens to be one of my millionaire friends. The attainment of wealth is not just a matter of intelligence. Mostly, it's a matter of inspiration. So if you have strong enough inspiration, a strong enough reason, large or small, it can have an incredible influence on the direction of your life. Now we're going to take some time to actually start designing the next 10 years of your life. We're going to start setting your goals. Goal setting is one of the most important skills to develop if you want to design your future. I'm going to give you enough homework not only to keep you busy for the rest of your life, but also to help you create the kind of life you may have always dreamed about living but never believed possible. So let's get on with it. The sooner you exert the discipline, the sooner you will be enjoying the results. Once the results start to come, believe me, you won't mind the hard work and discipline it's going to take. Now, get a sheet of paper and at the top of it, write the words long range goals. I'm going to ask you some questions and I want you to jot down the answers. If you don't have paper and pen handy, follow along with me now anyway, just listening. Then later, listen again when you can write down your ideas. After I've asked the questions, which is the first part of this exercise, you can stop the tape and work on your answers. 
All right, let's start this exercise. The basic question you are going to answer is, what do I want within the next one to 10 years? I want you to take about 12 to 15 minutes and make a list of at least 50 things you want within the next one to 10 years. These are long range goals. To help you get started with your list, consider these questions. What do I want to do? What do I want to see? What do I want to be? What do I want to have? Where do I want to go? And what would I like to share? Now with these thought starter questions in mind, answer the basic question. What do I want within the next one to 10 years? See how many things you can write down. At this point, don't take the time to describe in detail everything you want. This is the time for you to let your thoughts pour, to write fast and to abbreviate. For example, if you just write down 380, you'll know what that means. You don't have to describe the color and the interior of the car. You'll do that later in this exercise. I want you now just to abbreviate and write fast. Make the list as long as you possibly can. Try to write down at least 50 items, 50 things you want within the next one to 10 years. These are long range goals. Spend about 12 to 15 minutes on this. After you've completed your list, you're ready for the next part of the exercise. Go through your list and next to the things you think you can accomplish or acquire a year from now, write a number one. Next to the things you think it will take three years to realize, write a three. Next to the things it will take five years to accomplish, write a five. And next to the things it will take 10 years to accomplish, write a 10. Go through this list now to the best of your ability and say, that looks like it will take me about a year or three years or five years or 10 years. Some big goals might be out there 10 years from now. Once you complete this part of the exercise, you might come to the conclusion that you need a lot more three-year goals and less one-year goals, for example, or that you need more 10-year goals. You see, while you're working on one goal, you must have something else in the planning stages. If you don't, what happened to some of the early Apollo astronauts could happen to you. After they came back from the moon, some of those astronauts experienced deep psychological and emotional problems. And the reason for that, why after you've been to the moon, now where do you go? That seemed to be the end, the finish. What later astronauts did was to make sure that they had major projects lined up after they returned from the moon trip. The way you enjoy life best is to wrap up one goal and start right on the next one. Don't linger too long at the table of success. The only way to enjoy another meal is to get hungry. Another thing to check for on your list is that you have included goals for each of these three important categories. First, make sure you've listed your economic goals your goals for income, profits, and productivity. Second, make certain your list includes material items you want, tangibles, such as a home, a car, a boat, furniture, or jewelry. Don't attach the wrong importance to things, but they are important. Third, you'll want to include on your list goals for personal development. Write down all your personal development goals, your goals to be more physically fit, to lose weight, to be more decisive, to be a more effective leader, to be a better communicator, to learn another language. Of course, there are other types of goals to consider, family goals, social goals, lifestyle goals. This is pretty heavy homework, but remember, whether or not you do your homework shows up in the marketplace as well as in the classroom. After you have determined which of your goals are one year, three year, five year, and 10 year, and after you've made certain your list includes economic goals, things, and personal development goals, I want you to go back to this list again. Now pick out the four most important one year goals, the four most important three year goals, the four most important five year goals, and the four most important 10 year goals. Those 16 goals will give you plenty of work for now. 
get out some more paper and in a brief paragraph describe each goal how high how long how much what size what model what color for example also describe why it is important to you this is a process where you either talk yourself into it or talk yourself out of it which is good when you're unclear as to why something is important usually you put only half-hearted effort into it what you want is a powerful motivator but the reason why you want it is an even more powerful motivator it has greater pull you may find that some of your goals you thought at first glance were important are not important after all do some reflecting refining and revising the point is right now try to have approximately four one year three year five year and ten year goals that you truly believe in that inspire you that you've sold yourself on when these goals and the reasons you want to obtain them are each clearly described in a brief paragraph transfer this information to a journal or some type of notebook that you can carry with you easily and refer to often it's essential to set aside some time every week to review all of your goals to rearrange them redo them restructure them to add goals or to tear up the whole list and start over goal setting is not something you do just once it's a continual process also you must constantly check your progress toward your goals you don't want to fall too far behind on or worse lose sight of your important goals now just as important as your long-range goals are your short-range goals your goals for tomorrow next week next month six months from now these are goals you can accomplish within the next year the immediate future we call these goals confidence builders when you work hard burn the midnight oil and accomplish these little things it builds your confidence to go for your long-range goals write down in your notebook or journal all the little things you would like to have or accomplish in the next year how you set up this list is up to you you might want to break it down by week or by month set it up in whatever way works well for you part of the fun of having a list is being able to check off something as obtained or completed every week try to check off at least one thing on your list of short-term goals and when you are able to check off something major something on your list of long-range goals celebrate make winning joyful congratulate yourself it is very important to celebrate progress we grow from two experiences one is the joy of winning and the other is the pain of losing here's what that also means make losing painful put it on yourself if you set something up fooled around didn't pull it off put it on yourself and get around people who will help in this area hey don't join an easy crowd go where the expectations are high where the pressure to perform is high it's how we grow i'm certain that part of the reason why people let goal setting slide is because it is a lot of work as i said you'll be constantly revising your lists of short range and long range goals rearranging them refining them redesigning them establishing different priorities adding new goals perhaps deleting others it's interesting that so many people work hard on their jobs but they don't work hard on their futures they let that slide some people live such mediocre lives that at the end of the day they don't know whether they're winning or losing they just go through life with their fingers crossed i know most people don't make definite plans but don't let that be you the guy says well you work where i work but the time you get home it's late you've got to have a bite to eat watch a little tv and get to bed you can't sit up half of the night and plan 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 and this is the guy who's behind on his car note he's a good worker hard worker sincere but i've discovered that you can be sincere and work hard all your life and wind up broken embarrassed you've got to be better than a good worker you've got to be a good planner a good goal setter you've heard the old saying the people who fail to plan are planning to fail it's true 
So work on your plans. Put yourself in the top few percent who put this power to work for themselves. Writing your goals down also shows you are serious. And to do better, you must get serious. You don't have to be grim, but you do have to be serious. Hey, everybody hopes things will get better, but remember, the future does not get better by hope. It gets better by plan. And hope unaided by clear plans can finally become an illness. There's a Bible phrase that says, hope long delayed makes the heart sick. It's a sickness. I used to have the illness known as passive hope. It's bad. And there's one that is even worse, and that is called happy hope. That is really bad. The man is 50, and he's broke, and he's still smiling. That's bad. So get serious. Make plans. Put them on paper. My suggestion from experience. There's a phrase from the Bible that goes, without dreams and vision, we parry. How true. Humans have this unique ability to aspire, to dream, to go for something, to become something. Without that, life is not life. We must have dreams and never give up on our dreams. I'd like to share with you some further observations I've made on goal setting. Understand that your goals, whatever they are, are affecting you all day long. Your goals affect your handshake, your attitude, how you feel. Your goals affect how you look, how you dress, how you walk, how you talk, all day, every day. Your personality, conversation, activity, it's all affected by your goals. I asked a man one time, what are your goals for this month? And he said, if I could just scrape up enough money to pay these lousy bills. That was his goal. Hey, I'm not saying it isn't a goal. It is, but it's such a poor goal. It certainly isn't inspiring. You don't jump out of bed on Monday morning and say, oh boy, another chance to go out and scrape up the money to pay these lousy bills. The point is that goals should be fun. They should be big, challenging, rewarding. They should allow you to grow. Remember too, that the major purpose of having a goal is not just to acquire the goal. The major reason for setting goals is to compel yourself to become the person it takes to achieve them. In other words, attaining the goal is of secondary importance. What's far more important is what you become in the pursuit of it.